Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Erkenbrock. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce my colleagues in the School of Law uh, this evening, and uh, I'm really pleased uh, that you've joined us. I, I think this is going to be really interesting. I'm going to share my PowerPoint with you now. Um, and uh, help us to talk a little bit more about the School of Law uh, and its particular characteristics, because I'm very excited about uh, this law school that I work with. It's an extremely close-knit community. And we have a deep knowledge of the study of Asian and African legal systems. I know that's something that many schools may say, but in fact, we've been doing this and, and focusing specifically on Asia and Africa. Uh, for the duration of uh, our incorporation as a university. Uh, we focus on China, Africa, South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and our global South expertise provides a kind of perspective uh, that, that makes sense of not merely the global South, but of the world as we know it. Uh, so it's not merely area expertise that we bring to the table, but in fact, it's a methodology, a way of seeing the world and of, and of addressing uh, the most pressing problems. We have particular expertise in human rights, environmental crises, equality, the role of multinational corporations, trade, finance, and the global economy, or simply the rule of law and justice. And the methodologies that we employ are hugely important. We deal with doctrinal studies. Of course, black letter law is fundamental to understanding municipal legal systems. We employ critical legal studies, regional studies, historical interpretation, interdisciplinary work is very much an emphasis as a socio-legal methodology. We have particular strengths in international law, transnational law, human rights, commercial law, environmental law, and socio-legal method. Now, uh, you know, beyond our expertise, I think it's really crucial that you have a sense of the culture at SOAS, because the culture is a big part of what I think is a really attractive part of studies it's, it sets the tone for your studies. It's, it's the intellectual environment in which you, you will study, you will learn, uh, you'll engage in conversations with your peers and those conversations uh, along with conversations with your lecturers are equally important means of learning. Um, and so uh, I'd like to really focus on the fact that this is an institution which challenges convention. Uh, and we do that not merely culturally, but this is really an embodiment of our research focus, and that research find its, finds its way into our teaching. So I consider this to be a very progressive institution. I think that we, we show that through our, our emphasis and our leading emphasis amongst universities on decolonizing the curriculum. Uh, we've had a, a campaign known as the SOAS Justice for Cleaners campaign, in which we've ended outsourcing uh, as a university. These are two aspects that uh, I think are important, but, but more fundamentally, we are aware of privilege, structural inequality rooted in class, race, gender, and income. And these, this awareness is embodied in the kinds of discussions that we have amongst ourselves, uh, amongst students. And these are also, of course, uh, aspects of, of what we're interested in, in, in researching as academic lawyers and, and some as practicing lawyers as well practice in these areas. The SOA student body is really passionate and politically active. Uh, I did my PhD at SOAS. I've been here for quite some time. Uh, and I can assure you that this is one of the most cosmopolitan student bodies uh, that I think you'll ever ha have the privilege of experiencing. It's not merely international in terms of the North Atlantic. It's not merely Europeans that you're going to meet or North Americans. In fact, you're going to meet people from those parts of the world 
that we in fact study. We study parts of the world and people from those parts of the world come to sow us to learn uh, because of our expertise. And I think that that's really distinctive. Uh, and last but not least, the student societies are extremely active at SOAS, uh, so that there's a real uh, idealism and political activism uh, amongst uh, uh, SOAS students that um, I think really distinguishes it as an institution. I've often felt uh, that when I've gone out into the courtyard and, and uh, you know, uh, interacted with students, that you're experiencing such a colorful uh, panoply of life, such a colorful representation of the world uh, that uh, I think is just uh, really uh, valuable. Now, I'd like to just give you a very quick run through of what we do uh, in terms of uh, taught master's degrees. We do a general LLM and we focus on environmental and sustainable development. We do international commercial law, we do human rights, conflict and justice, international law, Islamic law, one of the very few law schools that teaches Islamic law as a family a system of law in a law school, law and gender, law development and globalization. I think you, you can see that we have a very strong emphasis on the issues uh, that relate to the global south and of course have applicability worldwide. Now, the uh, MA degrees are generally geared towards students without uh, a law degree. Uh, the MRes is a research-oriented master's degree, and a PG certificate program uh, is a new uh, one-term uh, master's taught program uh, in which you can get a taste for uh, what we offer at SOAS and get a certificate uh, from having done so. Uh, and there we offer environmental law, human rights, international law, Islamic law, a general legal studies program, as well as those two specialized programs. So I come to the part of the evening that I know you've come to us for, and this is uh, the lectures, the, 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 the tasters of the type of lecturing that we do at SOAS, and, um, and I have the privilege of introducing to you uh, two very talented colleagues. Uh, and the first is Dr. Michelle Staggs Kelsall. She's a lecturer in international law since 2018. And she studied in Australia with flying colors and did a master's in public international law uh, at the LSE and finally got her PhD from Nottingham. She's had considerable uh, experience in the human rights field. Most recently, she was deputy director for the Human Rights Resource Center for ASEAN and uh, a human rights officer for the uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Various, she's occupied various leadership positions with NGOs where they've done applied research uh, regarding Southeast Asia and West Africa. And this evening, she is going to talk to us about her expertise. And that is specifically business and human rights. And that's a module that she teaches uh, at SOAS and the intersection between human rights, corporate governance and corporate social responsibility. Before I turn things over to you, over to Michelle rather, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, really the big gun of the evening. Uh, and that is Professor Mashoud Badarin. Uh, Professor Badarin has been with us since 2007. He was the head of the law school uh, from 2009 to 12. He has published widely in the fields of Islamic law, human rights, international law, and law and development in Africa. His most recent publication uh, was Islamic law, a very short introduction, which if you know Islamic law is quite a feat. Uh, he's also published a very important uh, uh, monograph on international human rights and Islamic law. Both of those wor works are published by uh, the very prestigious Oxford University Press. He's been appointed as an independent expert on the situation of human rights in the Sudan uh, by the Human Rights Council uh, in the 19th session uh, on, in March 2012. 
He did his LLB in Nigeria, and he did his LLM and PhD at Nottingham. He's a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. And this evening, he will also provide a taster lecture on a module that he teaches here at SOAS, and that is Law and Development in Africa. So uh, SOAS is a very special place. Uh, I hope that gives you somewhat of a, a, a breadth of, of perspective about what, uh, what the law school is all about. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh, Michelle, I, uh, I turn it over to you. This evening's taste of lectures. Um, I too am going to share my slides, but just to briefly introduce myself, though I don't have to say much, thanks to Jonathan. Uh, as he mentioned, I teach here at the School of Law and uh, the master's program I teach here is Business and Human Rights in the Global Economy, which is both um, a theoretical component and has a clinical component in which students are encouraged and uh, get the opportunity to work with practitioners in the field. But tonight, uh, I really want to look at just one of the strands of the discussions that form part of my class. Um, and to give you a sense of what it would be like to come and study with us. I'm really looking at in the course how we understand the turn towards business and human rights at the start of the new millennium and why this field of academic inquiry, policy development and legal practice emerged in the aftermath of the global financial crisis in 2008. In particular, I'm wondering how the field of business and human rights might change the way in which international lawyers theorize and practice international human rights law in the 21st century. But those are the central questions I'm grappling with and that will be further discussed in a forthcoming book on the work with the working title Rights Incorporated uh, that looks really at the, the uh, history of the, the emergence of the movement, tracing it back to the new international economic order in the 1970s and looking at how the movement essentially de-radicalizes uh, the uh, demands of the global south at the time and becomes what is essentially a much more sanitized version of what the global south was was asking for um, but one of the things that I'm grappling with at the moment and that I thought I should share with you and I'd love to get your thoughts and feedback on is really this notion of uh, corporate wokeness and whether or not there is a sense in which the corporation, as we understand it in the 21st century, is shifting uh, in its function from being solely about ensuring profits for shareholders to in effect engaging in the rights and interests of stakeholders. A new form of stakeholder capitalism, which has been showcased at Davos, which of course in some ways the World Econo Economic Forum is kind of the pinnacle of economic discussions in the international sphere uh, in the last couple of years. And I'm grappling with what business and human rights and its interaction with stakeholder capitalism is really doing to our understanding, both of the corporation and of, of human rights. Um, but first of all, to situate us, to put us in a context, I wanted to start by um, showing you here both the uh, front page of a report issued by the UNCTAD, the United Nations Commission on Trade and Development, uh, just last year in 2000, October 2020, and juxtaposing that with, in the same month, um, a, a lead story on the front page of newspapers about the extent to which tech companies are now amassing staggering profits um, after the aftermath of COVID-19. So, as you can see that the uh, the title of the, of the article there is, As COVID-19 Surges, the World's Biggest Tech Companies Report Staggering Profits. At the same time, in that UNCTAD report, what they say is, among developing countries, the, the pandemic on poverty rates is expected to be severe, particularly in Africa. 
And LDCs, because of their LDCs, sorry, are lowest developed countries or least developed countries, because of their high vulnerability and limited capacity to adjust and respond to shocks, um, are in effect the most vulnerable. Africa accounts for about 13% of the global population, but is expected to account for over 50% of global extreme poverty in 2020. Um, the lack of social protection and labor programs in these economies makes it challenging to cushion the impact on vulnerable groups. So this is the context in which the discussion on business and human rights is operating. And I raise it here because business and human rights as a global movement seeks to respond to this by arguing that transnational corporations should at or continue to put front and centre those most vulnerable to corporate human rights abuse. Principle 24 of the United Nations Guiding Principles on Human Rights, which were unanimously endorsed by the Human Rights Council in 2011, ostensibly states that that is the purpose of the guiding principles. And just to give you a brief overview of what the guiding principles are, they're essentially a set of 31 principles that would, were agreed by the Human Rights Council, the primary human rights body of the United Nations in 2011. And I've got here, oh, John Ruggie's missing. Professor John Ruggie uh, and Gerard Pashu and Caroline Rees, um, the kind of dream, dream team of the, um, those who drafted the guiding principles. John Ruggie is currently a professor at Harvard. Caroline Rees works as president of SHIFT, uh, a non-governmental organization. And Gerald Pashu uh, represents 21 uh, multinational corporations who are committed to respecting human rights. And what the guiding principles say they do and what the movement which has, has come out of the guiding principles uh, attempts to do is to prevent corporate human rights abuses from occurring uh, through a three pillar system in which the state has the um, duty to protect human rights and an obligation of conduct to ensure that human rights are institutionalized and internalized in all their legislation and corporations have a responsibility to respect human rights. In other words, to do no harm and both together ensure access to remedies for victims. But the question that puzzles me or that I continue to ask myself is, to what extent should we think that the, the motivation and the mandate behind the guiding principles and the stories which those who operate in the business and human rights movement are actually able to achieve this rather lofty goal. Uh, and I think that there are three ways in which we can think about uh, the guiding principles and business and human rights and the narratives that the global movement tells itself um, that give us some insight as to what we can anticipate and expect from the, the movement in the next years. Uh, I suppose when I talk about narratives, what I'm really thinking about is the way in which the, the movement itself uh, animates the stories that it tells itself about its foundations, about its purpose, and about what it is members of the movement stand for. Uh, and although uh, some might cynically say, well, you know, business and human rights, the corporation is always going to be evil. There can never be anything good about the corporation. I think what we need to uh, remind ourselves is that the only way to fully understand um, the manner in which the movement is, is, uh, is attempting to, to create social change is to see it first and foremost on its own terms before we then critique what it is it seeks to do. So one way in which we can think through what the narrative is that animates business and human rights is really to see it as another form of woke capitalism. And uh, I understand and I'm, I'm very aware that in using the term woke, I'm of course uh, co-opting a narrative which has been utilized by uh, black persons and peoples to, uh, to signal and to push for social emancipation. Uh, and many have said uh, that the fact that corporations are now talking about work capitalism 
capitalism is in effect to the detriment of um, that initial and original narrative. But let's think first through how the corporations themselves conceive of this role. Uh, and I'm, I'm drawing here from the work of Jennifer Fan, amongst others, who talk about work capital um, in a series of articles recently drafted, uh, touching in particular on this issue. I think the, with, with respect to work, the role of the transnational corporation and business enterprises in the 21st century is seen as embodying that of a natural person in the legal person of the corporation. In other words, the corporation becomes in and of itself uh, a, a, a mode which is funding and supporting social causes. And this narrative shifts the role of the corporation from maximizing profits, as I mentioned, of its shareholders to maximizing its value for stakeholders. The classic view of the corporation embodied in conservative economist Milton Friedman's view of 1970 was that the one and only social responsibility of business was to use its resources to engage in activities designed to increase its profits. Stakeholder theory, on the other hand, assumes that corporations require a social license to operate writ large and challenges the corporations to broaden their role in society and enlarge their obligations beyond the bottom line. Uh, the problem, I think, with this narrative is that it assumes business and human rights can intersect with other social movements in a manner that remains value neutral and objective with regard to the central un underpinnings of a system that has made its wealth through developing and perpetuating racial inequality amongst other forms of inequality, most notably gender, sexuality and uh, ability or ableism. In their recent book, Stay Woke, A People's Guide to Making Black Lives Matter, Tehama Lopez Bunyasi and Candace Walsh Smith analyze how the original accumulation of capital uh, and the capitalism used in industry in the West came through the extraction of wealth from colonies, piracy, and the slave trade. And according to Bunyasi and Smith, the US state apparatus was created to facilitate the exp expansion and entrenchment of institutional racism in both slave and non-slave holding states at the time. The 14th Amendment of the US Constitution was passed at the end of the Civil War to give equal rights to black people. However, as Howard Zinn has shown through his People's History of the United States, despite the amendment being passed to prevent the very states to take away life, liberty and property from from African-Americans at the time, black people today, uh, between 1890 and 1910, there were 307 cases brought, brought to the US courts and 288 of these cases were in fact brought by corporations claiming legal personhood. And only 19 of which were bought, brought by black Americans. So in other words, judges applied these rights to capital and property, stripping them from people. So if we know this about the narratives that inform the capitalist system, the question becomes whether or not engaging in business and human rights as a narrative, uh, as a work narrative, in effect detracts rather than uh, adds or, or, or furthers the, um, the social um, emancipatory causes which corporations claim that they are going to go about undertaking through processes such as human rights due diligence and other forms of ensuring respect for human rights in their daily operations. And here I've got um, Coca-Cola recently uh, had a, a claim together we must uh, in the aftermath of um, the, the horrendous acts of police brutality last year and made claims with respect to how it was going to institutionalize equality, diversity and inclusion in the company itself. The question becomes whether or not we can really take seriously these claims. Which leads me, of course, to my second narrative, um, the possibility that in effect, this at the present moment, it's almost as though business and human rights is uh, acting uh, 
under the narrative guise of a comedic role. So in other words, not so much woke as it is joke. In other words, business and human rights forms a way in which we can virtue signal to one another that in effect, we agree with human rights and we uh, care about human rights concerns, even although we continue to maintain our status um, as wealthy and affluent in various contexts. I buy my coffee from Starbucks. I can rest assured that there's fair trade in the coffee and that the employers are being taken care of, even although the system as a whole, the relationality and systematicity of corporate human rights doesn't need to be questioned. So when we think about it in these terms, um, what business and human rights does is kind of create a panacea in which humanity can temporarily triumph over the world and the different forces at play can be reconciled and harmonized through this act of ensuring that I'm responding to um, the, the, the grossly uh, unfair circumstances in which many uh, in the global south find themselves. And finally, uh, oh, and here, I'm sorry, I've just got a snapshot of Kofi Annan saying that at the World Economic Forum in 1999, that this would, in effect, the UN Global Compact would allow for a human face to the global market. And subsequently, from the from, from Global Compact in 1999, the guiding principles evolved from there. And then finally, one final way I think we can think about it is neither to see it as quite so cynical as being a joke, nor so emancipatory as being, <clears throat> being woke, but instead to see it as bespoke. In other words, human rights becomes tailored to the business transaction itself. And this is what I really think based on my research of the archives of the, uh, the uh, UN from the 1970s till 2011 is essentially what the UN finally comes down on. Um, the notion that in fact, uh, what we can, all that we can do is secure human rights one transaction at a time. At a time. Uh, we need to embed shared social values into transnational corporations. Um, and to do so pragmatically, in, all the, in, other ways, in other words, always to ensure what works for the transaction. And there are, of course, limitations to the notion of pragmatism. Those of you who, have, who are uh, familiar with pragmatic schools of thought from the turn of the last century will note that pragmatism as a school of philosophical thought uh, essentially prioritizes that which um, can be empirically tested and which works uh, in, the, in the particular uh, frame of the, the demand or, or the, the discovery that's uh, going to be determined. And I think what that does is essentially limit the extent to which human rights can play a part in, in securing any kind of pushback between the relationality and systematicity of human rights abuses. And what you have instead is that where there was an older view of the economy as being embedded in society, uh, and here I've chosen a pasamalam from, from um, uh, 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 Southeast Asia where I used to live and work, um, but we could also uh, choose a, a, mark, a market in the middle of Rome or, or an, another market in another part of the, of the world. But essentially what I'm showing here through this photo is this notion that Transactions are part and parcel of everyday life, but it's life that gets prioritized. It's the other things going around um, the buying and selling of objects or the commodifi commodification processes in question. Um, this new economy, this no new notion of embedded pragmatism instead sees social values embedded in a global economy in which we're all networked and transactional. So I think it, it, it very much individualizes us and secludes us from any notion of community and precludes certain ways of thinking through problem solving um, in the everyday uh, and relies on theoretical processes that prioritize uh, that which, which is functional, utilitarian and which works over that which uh, may take longer term thinking in order to bring to fruition. 
And I'd like to close then finally with a little um, exercise in which we all close our, our, our eyes, just to give you a sense of what it is I'm talking about. Um, I'll do it too. If you close your eyes with me now and um, uh, just think of the first things that come into your head when I say these three words. Apple, Amazon, Shell. Okay, you can open your eyes now. And the question is, did your images look like this or like this? And if it looked anything like the latter, I think that's really what I'm getting at, the extent to which we think through the world now in terms of corporate understandings and how that affects and influences every uh, for human rights futures. Thank you. Um, I'll interject here, Mashoud, uh, would you like to give your uh, presentation, please? Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, for um, the kind introduction you did for me earlier. And I just wanted to build on Michelle's uh, very uh, interesting uh, perspectives on uh, human rights and cooperations. Now, I'll just be giving you some snippets from one of the courses I teach, that is law and development in Africa. Now, if you search around, you'll be able to see that. I mean, uh, I, I always say it's a unique course. It's only taught at SOAS. You'll find law and development modules in many universities, but specifically law and development in Africa, you won't find it anywhere else. And we created it in 2010 for a particular purpose. Now we know the question of, I mean, Africa's development has unrightly so been on the international agenda for quite a while. And also many African countries are also trying to uh, deal with that point. But at the beginning of this century, you know, the World Bank released a report in April 2000 titled, Can Africa Claim the 21st Century? You know, that's the title of the report, Can Africa Claim the 21st Century? The report noted that, I mean, although there have been some developmental gains uh, during the half part of the 1990s to, towards the end of the 20th century, it still found out that Africa entered the 20th century, you know, uh, as a poor, mostly colonized continent then, but yet it still faces enormous developmental challenges entering the 21st century. So it raised the, quite, it raised the bar and you found out that a lot of, I mean, academicians and also uh, um, practitioners in development started looking much more carefully at the question of, I mean, uh, uh, development, particularly in relation to Africa. Now, the report indicated that, yes, Africa could claim the 21st century. Particularly, uh, this would depend on Africa's ability, uh, aided by its developmental partners, to overcome the developmental traps that has actually kept it behind uh, during the 20th century. Now, it identifies certain strategies uh, improving governance and resolving conflict, investing in people, increasing competitiveness, reducing aid dependence and th things like that. But I mean, on my own studying of the report then, not very much was said about law. Everything, the concentration was on economics, economic development, economics, you know, and I started reflecting, thinking about this, that what is the role of law in all this? I mean, law, law should have a role in this. If we say, I mean, because, I mean, if you look at many of the traps, many of the causes of underdevelopment for Africa in the past, one would be able to be able to find out that, I mean, law had played a role in it. Now, so I started thinking around that in the context that, I mean, the relationship between law and development is not new. There's a general perception of law and development. And if you look at it, I mean, the history of it, it had a longer history and also a shorter history. 
the longer history of law and development usually is taken back, I mean, quite far into the 18th century, usually related to Adam Smith's discussion of the uh, economic effect of mercantilist uh, legislation. I mean, and the shorter discussion of it is in relation to the effort, you know, headed, I mean, spearheaded by the United States during the 1950s in order to try to promote the rule of law in the global south, in developing countries, in that perspective. Now, but if you look at all those perspectives in relation to general law and development uh, discourse, it doesn't focus specifically on Africa. There's no section of it that it's very theoretical. And I thought perhaps, I mean, there's a need to look at this specifically in relation to Africa. It took me some time, I mean, over six years to look at materials. And I found that there wasn't any material specifically talking about law and development in Africa. And I thought so I should really be, be, be focusing in that, in, in that perspective. And when we look at it, really, certainly law should, law should, law has or should have a role to play in relation to development. It's an important tool of um, uh, social engineering. Uh, and, uh, but when one looks at it from the context of Africa, it should not only be, I mean, from the context of liberal legalism, or I mean, in neoliberal perspectives. I mean, just transplanting, you know, the traditional law and development. I mean, um, connotations and just transplanting it into Africa. Now, it's very important. I mean, uh, for one to be able to know what to do in this perspective. I thought perhaps maybe there's a need to look back and see what has actually caused the developmental tragedies of Africa. Uh, uh, over time. The one also needs to contextualize what we mean by development and contextualize what we mean by law. So I'll look at these three perspectives, I mean, in, in a little bit. Now, when we look at, I mean, uh, um, a development contextualizing it, a lot of the time you find out that, I mean, in general law and development context, development is contextualized economically, GDPs, you know, and up till now, we look at it in the context of GDPs, and many African countries are still measured from that perspective. But I mean, uh, development should not actually be seen only from that perspective, because you find, I mean, many, some African countries are doing well now, as the numbers indicate, uh, Botswana, even Congo, you find the GDP, some African countries are said to be, you know, I mean, um, the highest developing countries in relation to their GDPs growing up 9%, 7%. But if you look at it critically, you find out that these gains actually does not filter to the grassroots. You don't see, you don't see the effects of, of it in relation to the, un, I mean, the poor people on the ground and things like that. Therefore development, I thought development should be recontextualized when we look at law and development in Africa. Uh, therefore, it should be seen in the context of human development. You know, when we talk about development, we look at it in the context of human development first. And it is in the area of human development, particularly, that it interjects with some of the issues being raised by Michelle. Now, when we talk about human development, and we are talking about issues in relation to, I mean, relating to human rights and development, that's empowering the individual. Looking at development, for example, I mean, and we look at it from two perspectives, from the basic needs approach, when you look at human rights from the basic needs approach, I mean, the basic needs of individuals on the ground. I mean, these should be factors to show whether an African country is developing or not, not only in relation to GDPs. Then the second point would be from the, I mean, human rights approach to development, you know, which actually sets a minimum sort of, I mean, a base ground for what people should, should expect. Then part of it is also, I mean, we normally look at four main elements in relation to human development, human rights generally, then we look at women rights and empowerment, that empowerment of women in Africa, because women, I mean, play a very, very significant role in development, I mean, anyway. Now, so we need to look at it also from that, then education and capacity building. And when we talk about human development, education plays an, an important role. Then the third one is human security. A lot of the time, I mean, nation states, we talk about state security, I mean, uh, in, when human rights are violated, when corporations don't do what they need to do, a lot of the time the state is bothered about, you know, its own security and also, I mean, um, watching the borders. But the argument in relation to human security is if human de development is prioritized, I mean, many of those things that lead to state failures, you know, that, I mean, actually threatens state security. If human security is looked after, you know, basic health requirements, you know, basic education, employment, you know, the threats against state security will be minimized. 
So especially in relation to African countries. So we look at the role of law. How can law actually be used to facilitate, you know, the enjoyment of human rights, uh, women empowerment, education, capacity building, and then human security. The next one is social political development. Now, social political development, I mean, relates to, I mean, governance, you know, good governance on the ground, I mean, constitutionalism, rule of law, then resource control. If you look at Africa, a lot of, I mean, the conflicts, I mean, happening on the ground relates to management of resources. I mean, resource control on the ground, resource control, conflict and development in Africa. Well, and then uh, Michelle was talking about, I mean, uh, when we talk about socio-political development, the third point is corporate social responsibility. I mean, the uh, corporations play a very big role in socio-political uh, development. And we do discuss quite a lot of interesting things. I mean, CSR social, I mean, uh, corporate social responsibility is usually seen as a voluntary trend for uh, corporations to be able to make input into their communities, into the society. I mean, and there are a lot of materials on actually arguing can this be made an obligatory requirement on corporations in relation to, I mean, uh, I mean their acts on, on, on the ground. Then the, th the fourth one is civil society engagement. Civil society plays a very important role in social political development. So we look at how law, you know, how law ought to regulate this and actually what is happening on ground in, in Africa. The third then comes to economic development. Economic development is important. Now we talk about, and when we talk about human development, social political development, you need some sort of, I mean, the economic development to be able to do all these things. Now, economic development, we look at trade and development in Africa, technological uh, innovations, economic and financial regulation, then, you know, uh, 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 corruption, particularly in relation to regulation of corruption. Now, I mean, uh, looking at it now, we contextualize this within, I mean, the courses of underdevelopment themselves. And the causes of underdevelopment, if you look at to learn from it, you know, uh, could be external or internal. In relation to Africa, externally, you know, you identify, you cannot, one can identify two main, I mean, external causes, and that is the impact of colonial legacies. I mean, if you, I mean, there could not be, African countries are not monolithic, but there are certain factors that unify all of them in relation to the underdevelopment. And these are some of these four, I mean, two external, two internal. The external one is, I mean, as I said, impact of colonial legacies. I mean, there are many writings on this, you know, colonialism changed the faith of Africa forever. Now it changed because I mean, the trajectory, the argument is, well, perhaps maybe the trajectory, uh, maybe if not for colonialism, things could have been worse. We don't know, but we know that it is colonialism that has actually pushed it into where it is now in relation to this. And we can see, we, we can look at a lot of materials in that perspective and how law has played a role. Now, if you look at, I mean, uh, during the times of colonial, I mean, um, um, uh, occupation of many of African countries, I mean, law played a role and there are documentations to that regard. Many of the African colonies were ceded by treaties. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they were ceded by treaties. I mean, law was used to legalize those occupations. You know, now if one says that, well, that was a deliberate colonial uh, um, initiative, then it shows that actually law can be used deliberately to achieve certain ends. If it was not a deliberate colonial, I mean, feature, then it means that law should be used consciously in order to avoid unintended consequences of not using it properly. So it's very essential. I mean, it gives us, I mean, if you look at South Africa, for example, apartheid was legalized by law. I mean, so law can play a role in relation to, I mean, and that is in relation to using law consciously. That is one important fact in relation to law and development. African countries need to use law consciously in order to, then the third, the second external factor is the impact of international policies. You know, many of it, I mean, Michelle have indicated, although, I mean, an African woman, a Nigerian heads the World Trade Organization now, you know, I mean, it's perhaps we will see what uh, could happen. Her, her first visit has been to the, an African country in Nigeria. But if you look at, I mean, I mean, um, 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 initiatives like, I mean, structural adjustment programs of the IMF for African countries, I mean, created a lot of problem in relation to development. So in impact of international politics is also an in external factor, which we look into and see how law on the ground can change that. Now, internal factors. We look, I mean, after colonization, colonization went away 60, 50 years ago, but yet Africa still grapples with development. Internally, this, the impact of poor leadership, poor governance, 
you know, poor government. You find out, I mean, uh, this has been the bane of uh, many, I mean, underdevelopment situations in many African countries. Then the second internal factor is, I mean, the impact of negative cultural and, I mean, religious practices, negative cultural practices on the ground. And um, there are so many of them. And we do you know, have a look at this and also uh, engage with them. Now, I mean, due to time, I mean, we, 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 look, we, we look at different African countries in relation to practice. You know, we need to look at a lot of African countries in relation to practice. If you look at the theoretical connotations, this course of, I mean, uh, uh, traditional law and development studies, you find out that the theories usually proposed for African countries, I mean, circles around what the so-called modernization theory, that is African countries need to modernize as Western countries, they have to learn from the, you know, move from the traditional societies to modern societies following, you know, I mean, uh, the, I mean, the Western path. And this usually leads to the dependency theory, whereby therefore African countries will have to depend on, you know, the Western countries in order to be able to follow uh, and do whatever. And we critique this a lot. And based on that, you know, I mean, based on materials, uh, uh, primary materials, I mean, resolutions of um, um, even the General Assembly, I mean, the United Nations, I mean, I propose the concept of, I mean, uh, the self-reliance theory. Africa needs to, there's, there's need for a self-reliance theory, not for Africa to stand alone, I mean, to be on its own, no. The self-reliance theory, I categorize it into, I mean, individual self-reliance and collective self-reliance. That African countries should individually, should look within to be able to particular in relation to those two internal element factors that impede development. And then collective, I mean, um, self-reliance. I mean, Africa, AU is doing quite a lot now in relation to I mean, free movement, free trade and things like that. African countries should need to, I mean, collectively, I mean, self-rely on, and then the collective self-reliance also relate to international cooperation. A lot of the time when we have student critics saying, are you saying that African countries should be on their own? No. You know, it relates to, you know, taking control of, of their own futures. The last point I want to talk about now is, I mean, legislating for development. I mean, I also push, there's a theoretical push also on the need for African countries to legislate for development. I mean, I mean, can, that is using law consciously, you know? I mean, Africa, the way laws are made in many African countries still follow the colonial tract of, I mean, uh, making laws. Uh, uh, legislative houses need to look, you know, there needs to be a higher objective for law in Africa. You know, the higher objective for law is law to aid development and uh, legislators should legislate for it. That is every legislation, the argument is every legislation should have a developmental objective. You know, it should have a developmental objective. Even criminal laws, I mean, they should have a developmental objective in relation to, you know, which will be consciously monitored in relation to how it fulfills those objectives, you know, where those objectives are very well in, in, um, established, then even the judiciary in interpreting the laws, you know, uh, they will be influenced in relation to uh, uh, those, I mean, developmental objectives. It's a very interesting course, really. It gives us opportunity to be able to see how Africa itself can serve it, looking, using law, you know, uh, uh, in various areas, touching on various areas. Three of us teach the course, as you say, it's quite a broad course. I mean, I'm with different specializations and I'm not an expert in trade. You know, we have uh, Olivia there who does trade and uh, Emilia also teaches on it. And therefore it's, it, it's very, very interesting. At the end of the I mean, course, students are really very fascinated. We tell them, I tell them, you know, yes, you've learned now go when you go back to Africa, go into the world and change the world. And we do get back a lot of, I mean, um, uh, feedbacks. You know, many students tell that many of our students from law, from development, one law student was telling me that, you know, he studied law, he knew law, but all he knew about law was about law and order. You know, law is just about law and order. Now, by taking this course, you know, he has really found a, a career path, which he really wants to move on into. So it's quite an interesting, and these are some of the, you know, novel things that we do at SOAS, which really makes SOAS very different. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And I hope perhaps maybe uh, you uh, make some benefit from what I've just said. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting uh, lecture, mini lectures, both of you. I'm captivated. I think um, now we should open it up to the Q&A session. 
Um, and uh, if I understand correctly, Kim, students will just subject, su submit their questions to the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of the, your screen. Is that correct? That's correct. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A um, and then they'll pop up um, if you just open up the Q&A um, and any questions will be in there. Um, and then we can answer them either um, through typing in or through answering them um, directly in live. So do feel free to pop any questions that you have in there. It could be about um, the content of uh, today's session. It could be about law in general. It could be about law at SOAS. Um, it could be about SOAS itself. Yes, indeed. Please, uh, anything you'd like to address, we're very happy to speak with you about. Don't be shy. Okay, I have one. Uh, the question is, what are the qualities we look for in a student? Um, uh, shall I address that? I, I, I'm, uh, I suppose I am the postgraduate uh, admissions tutor. <laughs> um, you know, we look for um, students who've done well academically. Uh, and I believe for uh, postgraduate Postgraduate taught courses, uh, you'll have to have a high 2-2. Two -two. That's around a 57% average, depending upon where you come from. Um, but we also look for uh, extracurricular uh, activities. Uh, we're interested to know what you've been engaged in. If you have uh, shown an interest in law or in social justice uh, activities, um, how passionate you are for study uh, at SOAS specifically, uh, what you have in mind in terms of your career, why, you know, why you'd like to study at SOAS. So there's a, a wide range of characteristics that we uh, take into consideration, not merely academic ones. Um, and, uh, and they can be used to augment, for example, uh, marginal shortcomings where uh, your academic uh, results may not uh, achieve uh, or may not meet our requirements. Further questions, I hope, more substantive ones aimed at these very fascinating uh, lectures, professors that I have. Would you recommend doing a law MA full-time over one year or does it make little difference doing it over two years? Any, any comments from my colleagues on that? Well, I mean, if I mean, I actually just had um, an inquiry from a student who is my um, personal advisee um, regarding this, because we also, you know, we also have uh, the three year route term. I mean, the part time could either be two years or three years. Now she initially was doing a part time of two years because she's working fully. And I mean, even that she found out that, I mean, because of the nature of her work, she was finding it, I mean, quite difficult to be able to cope. And she was considering whether to move onto the three-year route. And therefore she got in touch with me too. So a lot will depend on what you do. The two-year and three-year routes are for those perhaps maybe who, are, who want to do it on part-time basis and they will have time to, to work. Because I mean, the one-year route, although uh, students I understand also do some part-time job, I mean, all master's programs in the UK are intensive. I did my own master's in the UK as well. I mean, they are very demanding. If you want to really do well, if you want to do well in them, you hit the ground running and you have to really commit time to it. So you have to decide, you know, uh, what you want to do. In one year, you do it quickly and you get it done, but you need for you to do well and get a good grade, you have to really commit time to it. Otherwise, I mean, if you want to work full time, the right thing to do is to do the part-time route, either of two years or three years. That sounds pretty sensible to me. Uh, absolutely, it's very intensive. And uh, I did my master's uh, at, at the LSE, in fact, and I found the same, that if I'd done it over two years, I may have done a little bit better because it simply was so intensive. That being said, the 12-month the route is quite attractive, I think. 
Uh, yeah. yeah, and just to add to that, I think it also depends on what you want you want from your master's course, what, what your intention is. I think the, the one year route is a good way of also being, being able to collaborate with peers and to meet other people engaged in the master's course. I think part time it's possibly more challenging because you're not necessarily part of a, a group that's intensively studying in that one year. So just to add to what they've already, what both Jonathan and Michoud have said, which I fully agree with in terms of intensity of the course and workload and whether or not you're working. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, I'll just read that out, Clara, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you to the excellent panelists. Well, that's all Michelle and Mashoud. What do you think are the prospects of a face-to-face -face teaching uh, in 2020-21? And what is the SOAS plan to address studying during the pandemic? I mean, if I just answer briefly from what I know, the plan is that in September, the academic term uh, of 2021, that in fact, face-to-face um, -face teaching will uh, recommence, Clara. Um, and uh, in the event that there is some sort of restrictions with respect to COVID, uh, the institution will uh, conduct so-called blended learning. So a mix of face-to-face -face and uh, remote learning. But I think it, uh, you know, by September, uh, the vaccination uh, program in this country has been uh, is is quite successful. It's fast moving, uh, and everybody anticipates to be able to have uh, some degree of face to face uh, interaction. I don't know if somebody, uh, if you'd like to add to that, uh, Michelle or Mashoud. Just to reiterate, really, what you've said, Jonathan. I think all our plans are to be back on campus in September, and the goal is either full. Uh, back on campus or, or a blended, a form of blended learning in which there'll be some online activities and some face-to-face -face teaching, depending on how things have progressed in terms of the vaccines in the UK and also in terms of the number of students who are, of course, um, overseas students, because there may be various things we need to take into account with respect to their capacity to make it, make it with us on campus. Yeah, I mean, I agree totally. I, I think, I mean, the ideal, what we all want, even, I mean, lecturers, is for us to be on campus, to be teaching face to face. Similar to all other UK universities. I mean, whatever decision will be taken by SOAS will be guided by government regulations. In relation to, I mean, depending on whether there's another lockdown or not. Uh, so, but we hope with the vaccine hopefully things will pipe down and uh, we'll be we're all looking forward to get back on campus uh, definitely that's for sure let's move on to neva's question she writes i will be applying to an ma in another department anthropology but i'm really interested in law does the law department conduct lectures uh for other masters uh or can we join some of your lectures even if we register to another ma uh, and thank you uh, for your presentations. Um, that, um, to the best of my knowledge, Neva, uh, if you do uh, enter as an MA student in law, um, you should have some elective modules, if I'm not mistaken. And those elective modules uh, would give you the ability to study in other departments. But if you're studying, say, in anthropology, uh, you should have the same capacity to take a law module uh, in the law department as part of your anthropology program. Uh, and, and it's all done in terms of credits. The easiest way to figure that out is plain and simply to go to that MA program in anthropology and look at the structure of the program uh, which will say specifically uh, how much freedom you have to uh, visit uh, courses in, in other departments. So uh, moving on to uh, J.A. Maldonado Andrews' question, he's thanking you both for your presentations. Uh, Professor Badarin, you talked about the importance of legislation and development. From my experience in a colonial context, Puerto Rico, law and legislation can be very rooted in colonial practices. Right. Would you share any thoughts on how to confront traces of colonialism from a legal system? 
Yes, I mean, uh, thank you so much. That's a very, I mean, uh, good question. Um, I mentioned it earlier. If you see how law, for example, is, I mean, how legislation is done in many uh, African countries today, or perhaps maybe other uh, uh, countries in, in the global south, it's rooted in, I mean, a, a colonial context. Now, there have been a lot of uh, research on this. I mean, uh, Seaman and Seaman have written a very good article on this in relation to uh, how legislation, particularly in region to Africa, should be um, um, uh, moved on with. One question that usually comes up when we talk about, I mean, legislation in relation to development or law in relation to development is that, well, uh, there's no need to think about legislation or there's no need to think about the law. It's implementation that is the problem. People talk about the fight implementation, but usually research has found that no, if you want to say good legislation actually should incorporate, you know, processes of implementation, good, good implementation. So if a law cannot be implemented, then it's not good law. I mean, so, that, so that's part of the new processes we are talking about that I mean, and previously the colonial, I mean, means of legislation previously doesn't look at that. And that is where legislating for development comes into the, into the issue. Now, if you have a, a developmental objective, the law itself then must provide ways by which, I mean, implementation is monitored to make sure that it follows, I mean, the trend of uh, 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 development. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the debate. And uh, there are quite a lot of materials on this rather than, now one, one question that um, uh, one of the students raised when we're looking at this, I mean, in actually this year was that, well, he said, but that's not how law is made. Now, for example, in it was talking about, at it from a colonial context. It was talking about it in the terms that when law is made, you just have a title to the law and then you see still the substantives of the law. I said, well, who says this can change? Now, who says that is how it should be done all over? You know, I mean, we are talking, that's exactly why this course is, I mean, important. I mean, to look at possible ways by which, you know, we change the process of legislation and also, I mean, uh, taking policy into consideration and ensuring that, I mean, the law is good for implementation to achieve its objective. Thank you. Um, Narion writes, uh, may you speak a bit about the scope of employment after completion of a master's uh, in international relations at SOAS, considering the post-pandemic situation. Of course, uh, we uh, are stewards of law, not international relations. We do deal with public law, and I suppose uh, that uh, is related to international relations. I mean, employment is 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 very tough, Narayan. Um, I think globally, uh, in 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 relation to uh, the pandemic, um, I've just read an article uh, actually in the FT on exactly uh, students, uh, uh, you know, situation in in this regard. And all I can say is it's, it's, it's really critical, I think, to focus on um, distinguishing yourself as best you can uh, in your master's degree um, so that because you're, you're, you're competing with uh, a large body of, of candidates, candidates that have lost their jobs, but also recent graduates um, and, and so the, the pool of, of, of candidates for any position is much greater than it has been uh, in recent years. And then, you know, the only way to, uh, I think, you know, to, to, to deal with that is, is simply to really do your best to distinguish uh, yourself in, in your academics, but also I would think extracurricularly uh, to show a potential employer uh, what makes you uh, special. Uh, what makes you different? Uh, I don't know if my colleagues want to, to add to that. That's a very hard question. In the second part you mentioned, oh, sorry, Michelle, go on. No, go on. no, go please. On. Uh, the, the, the second part you mentioned, Jonathan, I think is important. I mean, there are so many master's programs all over the world. I mean, what makes you special, as you rightly mentioned, particularly in relation to the area of study. Now, at SOAS, as we said uh, earlier, I mean, many, if, for example, if you are interested in um, uh, joining international organizations, a lot of international organizations, most of the work of um, international organizations, the UN, 
and even EU now they are trying to have impact on the ground in Africa. They are looking through through to Africa. So having that specialization may give you an edge. Now language also plays a, a very important role in it. I mean, at so as people have opportunity to do languages as well, languages of the global south. You know, if you have an you are LLM and you know the language of I mean, particular, I mean, it it it, it gives you an edge. About, for example, employers will look at, okay, if you want to send somebody maybe to um, Kenya, and this person can also speak Swahili, you know, I'm having it's 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 an add-on to, you know, uh, to your degree. Yes, Michelle. Now. Yeah, just to add to what my good colleagues have said, I think, um, yeah, it really depends on the kind of career that you're thinking about, um, and certain certainly, I think having a master's degree from SOAS in certain careers and certain um, fields is seen as a very, very reputable and prestigious institution to have gone to. So certainly at the UN, of course, where I've worked, um, that's something that will set you apart initially. And then as my colleagues have said, it will also be your own personal story and what it is about you that they can see um, fits with the uh, organization and, and the aspects that they're looking for in, a, in an employee. But um, one of the things that we do at SOAS is that every student is given an academic advisor. And certainly I'm sure, depending on uh, who your academic advisor is, they can provide some guidance or at least some dis discuss with you uh, your prospects post masters, what it is you intend to do and um, certainly we'll be able to write references, I believe. That's what we do here at Law anyway. We write references for all our, our academic advisees um, with respect to uh, any future employment um, that they go for. Yes, indeed. And we have a, a, a very good uh, career service as well, which uh, offers a wide range of services. So you, you know, it would be a good idea, I would think that at the very beginning of your studies that you, you start strategically planning uh, for the particular type of job you're interested in and doing everything you can to, you know, to develop your, your, your CV so that it, it meets the, the specifications of the type of candidate that, that that type of uh, job is, is potentially looking for. Um, let's uh, move on. Charlotte, uh, you mentioned that there was a clinical component uh, to the business and human rights module. Um, and are there other uh, opportunities like that in other modules? Uh, Michelle, are you aware of, uh, of that clinical? Yes, um, to my knowledge, there is um, a small clinical component available in uh, one of the asylum and immigration courses as well. Uh, we currently have a clinical legal scholar who's coordinating all of our efforts um, and she's probably the best person to speak to with respect to your query. So I can certainly give you Clara's um, uh, details so that you can speak to her, Clara Del Croce, with respect to clinical legal components um, that are available to master's students. I, I was also thinking of Lynn's Human Rights Clinic. Yeah, oh yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's uh, another human rights colleague who runs a human rights clinical component. So the entire course is in effect uh, clinical legal uh, studies and you will be um, attached to a particular organization and then engage in a particular human rights issue um, and write uh, particular reports with respect to that issue or engage in particular kinds of activities around that. That sounds like a fun module. <laughs> yes, it's great. She's on sabbatical at the moment, so I momentarily yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, that's it's available. <laughs> Uh, Amrita writes, I'm coming with a background in international relations. What preparations do I need before joining SOAS in September? Um, Amrita, you, you basically just need to bring yourself in September. It depends on uh, whether or not you've been admitted. Uh, and, and, and I would presume that uh, you would apply for an MA with an IR uh, background. Um, but that, that background is perfectly suitable uh, for law study. 
Um, in fact, I think it's uh, very useful. It's very, very related in particular, as I mentioned, to public law. Uh, colleagues, again, my wise colleagues might know more than me. <laughs> Certainly in public international law, you'd, you'd be well placed. I had some international relations uh, students, both in my business and human rights class and subsequently in international law classes as well. So we'd happily have you join us. Uh, any questions? Any further questions? I don't see any anything else written there. Any follow up that you'd like us to address? Okay, well then uh, I guess what remains to be done is simply to thank you for your uh, time and, and, and interest in uh, the SOAS School of Law. And of course, uh, to thank my uh, colleagues for their uh, erudite lectures, uh, which I'm sure all of you uh, uh, really enjoyed, uh, or I hope you did at least. Uh, uh, if you'd like to say anything, Mashoud, Michelle, uh, you're free to do so. Otherwise, I'll just bid you uh, farewell and uh, hope to see you at SOAS. Just want to thank everybody for their time, for staying uh, tuned to the end. Thank you so much. Thank um, you as well. Glad to come. We look forward to seeing you.